bait can be cumbersome and slow. You gotta go to the bait tank, you're excited, chances are you drop the bait, or probably <laughs> y'all are laughing. You've done that, haven't you? Yeah. Like, yeah. And usually over the wrong side of the gun, which means we gotta go back to the bait tank. Try a spoon. Get somebody to drop a spoon. You can get it down to him like that. Particularly if you're talking about a fish that's 30 or 40 feet deep. You don't need heavy tackle, bass tackle's fine, 12, 10 pound test, something like that. Fire it down there and start jigging the spoon. Uh, flex it, I think, or jigging spoons in general, but particularly a flex it, I think it's one of the most underutilized lures that we that we use as striper fishermen. Keep one tied on. This will surprise you. It's also one of the best things you can throw a stew in fish. We've got it in our mind when we see a school and fish, we want to throw top water. This is fun. I understand that. I like to catch fish with top water. If you think about it, top water, it can be remarkably inefficient. How many times have you ever had a spook and you've watched two or three fish swim around it, knock it in the water, jump over it? And I, that's very entertaining, but when it's all said and done, you don't have anything on your line with the spook. Right? Flex is spoon. It's small, it's compact, it throws. It doesn't have to be a flex it. Uh, something like a slice spoon, like an Acme Castmaster, which I don't even find those anymore. But the advantage of a spoon is it's a bunch of holes in the wind. You know, you've all seen this. Our school and fish have a really, really bad habit of being just about 15 feet further than you can cast. That spoon will give you that extra 15 feet. If you take the treble off, put an octopus on it, your hookup ratio will be way, way higher. And again, because I've been guiding all my life, I'm, I'm been indoctrinated into numbers. I'm looking for numbers. I can get the fish up to the boat with a spoon and get him off the hook and get it back in the water quicker than I can in most scenarios with the top water. Because you've got all those hooks to deal with. And a lot of times you've got multiple hooks in the fish. The spoon's not as glamorous, it's not as much fun, but it's a really, really good tool. And we often use it more. When do you start that, Mac? I would start having one tied on right now. And what, you want on octopus hook? Yeah, one or, yeah. The same one you bait fishing with. And if you see fish on top, Throw it past them. If they're on the top, you can kind of reel it and skip it across the top. They'll come and hit it. Here's the other advantage of the spoon. If they go down, once they sound, it's hard to pull them back up to the top water. Just throw your spoon out there and let it sink on a tight line and let it follow them down. A lot of times they'll hit it down there 15, 20 feet. It's good to catch bass. I know you got a striper guys, but not, if you see bass on top, it's a nice bonus spot. And then you also have the option of having something tied on. When you look at the graph and there they are, boom, you start fishing vertical. It's really, really a very versatile lure, very underutilized. And there's a lot of good spoons out there. The Flexit is probably the most popular on this lake. It's a very good spoon. It works. Uh, gosh, there's other brands. Uh, uh, the Hopkins spoons are good spoons. They're very expensive. Uh, the Cotton Cordell CC spoon is really a good spoon. It's really inexpensive. And the War Eagle spoon. The War Eagle makes a spoon. I really don't think it makes much difference at that point. They're all good. The Flexit's claim to fame is you can bend it. I rarely bend it, it slows it up. So that's a personal preference. A lot of the bass guys like to bend it where it'll do more of this. I want my spoon to go straight through the bottom as quick as possible, and I want to stay there when I get there. And a big chunk of metal does that better than one that's got the flex. So, what else do you use? I usually try and use a one. Uh, you can use smaller ones, and sometimes those are good. They match the hatch better, but a one, same thing. If I see a fish at 40 feet, I can get it there, and I can keep it there. The boat's moving, it's windy, I can still keep the bird better than I can something that weighs a half an ounce. Do you jig it just like you do on the spot almost? Where you yeah, the same thing. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And you keep your line tight when you're going down. Yes, that's crucial. That's a great question. When jigging a spoon, we keep our line tight. Yeah, you'll probably find that unlike when you're power reeling with a Parker spoon, a huge percentage of your bites will come when it's falling. A huge, maybe 90 plus. So if you pop your spoon up, you just drop your rod and let it go down, he's busy to spit it out. You pull it up, it's over. So they won't hold it. You'll figure out real quick that's a big chunk of lead. So I lift my spoon, and a lot of times I don't lift it far. Actually, I don't like to lift it much above my belt. If you get a bite and your rod's up here, picture this, and this is true for a lot of kind of fish, but you're spooning like this, and all of a sudden your rod's here, and you drop it, and he bites it right there. There's nowhere to go. All you can do then is let it go and hope he gets it again, and one of his buddies get it again. If you're right here, then you can lift and reel, and you'll stick. But yeah, and strikers will be the same, particularly I think when you're fishing. Right now, if you go out and see those fish I was talking about that are over a fairly shallow bottom, they're, they're more prone to hit the spoon as it falls, not limited to. It's sure. really finesse fishing, too. If you're not paying attention, you'll spit that thing out so quick. That's what makes it fun. If you lift it, you drop it, you lift it, you drop it. And the third time you do it, it only drops half as far as it did the other time. Good chance somebody's chewing on it. So if you're using an octopus, and from what I picked up, you're using a J-hook, so 
at that point you're trying to cross the dots when he hits it? Uh, not in this. That's a great question because we've rolled over out of the treble hook and we got a single hook. We're using a J hook. We, do we need to set the hook? Yes, but not like you would if you're fishing a plastic worm. I'm more worried because I got all that motion and movement, and I envision when the fish bite the spoon, you got fish out down there moving around. You, you, I think you want to always picture your lines coming from your rod tip straight to the spoon of the fish. The spoon, you know, he may grab the spoon and move, and I want to get the line tight. So I set the hook, but crank more importantly. I just want the rod to get good bend in. That's a great question. Get it tight. That's the best way I can explain it. Use the real handle, use the rod. And here's the other thing. This drives me nuts. I see this in the boat all the time. This drives me nuts. Okay, guy's spooning. He misses one. He reels it up as quick as he can. So we can drop it back down there. Just let it go back down there. Really, they, the fish is like this. <laughs> Chances are you find it if you leave it down there. And then the first thing he does is reels it up. Fires it right back down there. And I start putting people in timeout for that. In the boat. <laughs> leave it down there. And if you got a picture too, a lot of times with stripers, there's 50 fish. One misses it. He'll either bite him or one of his buddies. Leave it down there. Let him do it. Let him eat it. You, you know, you got it to the point. You got their attention. You got one of them fooled. They're ready. Don't are, you, are you dressing those with feathers or or plastic? Sometimes that's a great question. Do I add? Do I use a bucktail uh, dressing or mylar dressing? And generally, I don't because I want the spoon to fall, and that slows it up. Okay. I want it to fish as straight up as down as possible. And particularly if you start getting past 40 feet, put any dressing on. Maybe not mile or flashy boot because it's pretty thin, but bucktail tends to slow it down. So, no, I'm just fishing the spoon on the hook. A great question. Good question. But yeah, that, everybody needs to keep a box full of spoons starting now. Yeah, Tom? The general rule for your trailer and your bucktail cloudy versus sunlight. That's another good question. Trailers on the bucktail, and I do think trolling. You will enhance your bite a lot if you use some kind of trailer. And that's just that's the most basic trailer ever. That's a six inch trailer. As a general rule, if it's I go darker with low light and lighter with bright light. That color right there, that was fades out pretty bad. That's that's chartreuse on this lake day in and day out. That's hard to beat. But I will keep white, I will keep something dark like a blue. Uh, chartreuse is um, pearl is always good. Um, maybe even, we don't use them much, but sometimes purples are black will work if you've got really low light conditions, which again will be dusk, dawn, night, or deep water. Remember, right now, if you went out there right now and go to 80 feet, it's dark it down there. It's, sometimes we lose sight because it's you know, real bright sun, the sun's straight up, but it's dark where they're at. But yes, I think a trailer is a big advantage. Um, a plastic, a, a twister tail like this, a shad body, or a live herring. Any of you using herring for trailers? do that. It's a good way. That's, that can really be an asset some days. Uh, I usually start out with a live herring and a plastic to see which one involves. Some days it's not an asset. A lot of days it is. But the problem with a herring is you get a lot more short bites. We see Roger that and we're going to grab the herring right behind the hook before we the there. But live herring probably underutilized as a trailer. Then ask your question, huh? Because you, you can get a lot of you can do a lot of research by changing trailers. You can change colors. You can change the whole profile of the bait by going smaller or bigger. You can change the action by going from a twister tail to a shad body. So, a lot of, a lot of things here, yeah. I've noticed you get a lot of short bites. Do you have a stinger in anything that you pull? Yeah, that's a good question. And then, yeah, that had, you're talking about like in the last three weeks. In the last three days. Yeah, I right. don't know. I wish I could explain that, and it, and it happens a lot. And I don't think it's a little fish. I think one people want to explain it off as little fish. But yes, yeah, a trailer hook. Here, hand that back to You see that jig's got a trailer on. A, a stinger hook or a trailer hook will enhance your stripe hookup ratio pretty darn dramatically right now. And I I don't know why, and it's, sometimes it's bad late in the summer. I don't yeah. fish are just picky or finicky, but that will get you an extra bite. Now, the key to making that work is you got to put the trailer, whatever it is, whether it's a herring or whether it's a plastic, you got to put it on the front hook. Or you lose, I, really, I don't mean, this sounds facetious. But if you put your trailer on the back hook, you're still going to get short bit because he's going to respond to that trailer. And that so you put the trailer on the front hook. You know, it's and funny, they, when I read your report on that. I bought a couple of them, and they were really good on the short bite. It took me, that took me 20 minutes to figure out how to get the stupid trailer on there. Because you're rigging it differently than you normally would. I finally figured it out. We, uh, we'll, uh, we'll put something on, on I, I, you, I do it the same way you did on that one there, but it took me a really stupid thing. 
but it's really out of what you normally do with a trailer on there. It took me a minute. It to looks it goofy out. too, doesn't it? It does. It doesn't yeah. look right in your mind. Right? No. And what you have to do, what I always do, whatever it is, whether it's a herring, whether it's plastic, and y'all pass that around. Like I said, I'll be here. You come up and look at it. Oh, Put yeah. the trailer on the front hook, lay it in the water, and make sure it's going to swim, and make sure the trailer doesn't ball up on one, on the other hook, and, and where the fish can't get hooked up. So how did you take the trailer? So you did ran wire around it? Yeah. That's all yeah. you did? We buy them like that, right? Yeah, we make that. Rig. Yeah, and we, that's tied. We're looking at better ways to tie it because it, it so, can't hold up. Have you ever tried flipping it around and using a piece of a rubber band? Yes, that would work, or you can actually just take a hook and get a, something, some of the eagle claw hooks have really big eyes, and you can force it over the barb of that hook. You don't have to buy that, put a stinger with it. No, I like that. But now, you, you can also use a little gamagatsu. I cannot remember the part number, it's called a G-stinger. It's just a stinger hook, it's got a little rope on it, and you can wrap it around the bottom hook, and it's small enough, you can actually put it in the plastic. Now, a little, like with a really big shad body, this is something else too. When it gets hot like this, big baits seem to do really well. And a, a six inch or eight inch shad trailer will get you a bite. But the problem you're talking about, a, you know, it's a huge piece of plastic. If you don't put a stinger hook in it, your short bites just go sky high because they can't get to the hook. I actually sold a trailer in that. It's a pain, but if you don't do it, you really, at six inches, not too bad, but if you get past a six inch bait, your short bites will go through the roof. So I actually take a bait needle run a hook through the plastic and bring the stinger out and let it lay in the back of the shaft body and then tie the other end off to the hook on the jig. It's a pain, but it'll get you an extra bite. But yeah, that stinger hook is absolutely in value. And this, you'll see that happen, though. Sometimes this time of year, I don't know what it is, it gets worse. And at first I kind of started blaming it on a little bitty fish. It's not just a little fish. I'm satisfied. It's, I don't know if they're just looking or they're not very serious about it. But that gives you guys some stuff to think about. But don't do anything different than you're doing right now. The pattern hasn't changed yet. If you look at a weather forecast, Tom, I did a little research. It's the toughest thing in the world for me. Man, that's, I wouldn't have done that to anybody but you. For me to tell y'all what, I think they're going to buy it. It's going to stay warm. It takes a lot to get this lake turning over. What you're seeing now, I think, are the subtle effects of the season change. You know, look at our daylight. Our photo period's going way down. They know it's coming. We got a season change. There, is, there are some changes in water quality. If you look at, and I'll try to get it posted this week. The last profile that Dan Artist did, the O2 profile, not near as good as one two weeks ago, and that has a lot to do with it. And I think a lot of fish are seeking out good water. But, but the pocket thing that I was talking about with fish getting in pockets, that's pretty common this time of year. That can be a really good pattern, maybe not a big fish pattern. There's still some big fish out there on the river channel, but it's harder to get a bite. You know, I'm, I'm having trouble running the numbers. Yes, sir. What line is on that grill? Uh, that is a 27 pound uh, tough line, yeah, which is a really good lead core. Uh, I like the tough line product. New broad, if you can find it, it's a really good lead core. And the suffix does all right. Yeah, tough line, and you should be able to find it about anywhere around here. They also make a micro lead you might want to look at. I don't think you can play around the micro lead. It's about 40% smaller than regular lead core, which doesn't necessitate that giant reel. And lead core stuff is physically hard. You can take a couple guys like this and pick bulky tackle, it's harder on them. Right? A lot of my clients can actually complain about it. And I switched the lead core to the micro lead. Now we, it's, it's gone. Nobody's got any. But micro lead will let you use smaller rod and smaller reel. And it's just, the performance seems to about, be about the same. And another question while we're talking about lead core, I get this all the time. The sink rate between 18, 27, 36, and 45 lead core is almost identical. The lead content's the same. The difference is the nylon sheath or the Dacron braiding that's around the lead core is heavier. It's a little thicker and give you more line drag, but the sink rate will be pretty much the same. As a general rule, if you've got a one ounce jig on lead core, you'll get about three and a half feet of depth for every color of lead you've got in the water. If you go to a two ounce jig, you'll get about four feet of depth for every color of lead you've got in the water. Based on the speed just under three miles. You start playing with your speed, that number gets skewed quick. But that and that's a real general guideline. Any, any questions? Uh, quiet tonight. Think about it. Hey, Mick, I noticed one thing too that <clears throat> pulling the leg core, you get hooked up. 
I have a lot of people that they'll start reeling and say, oh, it came off, it came oh. off. Please keep reeling that oh. fish. Well, that's a good point. And I have the same thing happen every day. They stop and leave the rod. Don't do that. Because they change direction. And the lake course is so spongy, it's, it's kind of dead when you got eight colors out there. Buck's right. Fish is just going that way. He doesn't realize which way you're going. It's really. And a lot of times he's there, and you're just you're just giving him slack. You're enabling him to escape. So keep reeling. Mac, how tight do you want your drag? You know, I hear all kinds of different things. It depends who I'm fishing with. And I don't do it very much, and I don't like lead core much, but I'm thinking I'm going to have to do it in October. And how tight should I set my drag? I, I, I wouldn't do it any different than I did it with anything else as far as I want him to be able to spin my drag. Uh, I don't set it it's just like a live bait drag or an umbrella drag. He needs to be able to turn it. Uh, you know, you don't get much stretch with that lead core. So I want it to have some give. You know, yeah, just... Treat it like you would your umbrella. I don't use a scaling pan, do it by hand. But I want him to be able to spin the drag as soon as he bites it. So it's not very, it's not, it's almost like braid as far as a stretch. So I need, I want that gift. Even with that distance out, it's, that nullifies some of it because he's 300 feet behind you, or potentially. And you're right, Lake Orr, it's not my favorite way to fish, but you can't deny the fact it works. And it's a great search tool. Uh, you know, you don't know how many times, and this is something y'all can try this. And, and this happened a lot earlier in the year. You'd see a big bunch of fish and you're pulling lake or maybe you're pulling an umbrella, and then it'd be lake or But you hook one on each side or each rod, go ahead and just drop your trolling motor and watch. When you get those fish up the side of the boat, turn around, look at your graph, a lot of times you'll pull all their buddies right up there. Not as much as one, but if I hook two fish on lake or I just go ahead and stop. Kill the engine and drop the trolling motor. And I'll go ahead and hang a live bait down there. Because again, when they get up there, we need something for them to look at. Then they get bored. They just leave. I'll get a live bait down there and I'll grab a spoon and start powering it. It's amazing how many times I had that happen this summer. Both when when I can see both fish from my eyes, I look at the graph, and there it is, the herd off right under me. And they're waiting for you. They're just waiting for you to see. You can go from fishing, you're feeding them at that point. But Lake Core is probably Tom the greatest thing. It's probably the greatest search tool ever made. I don't think you can argue that. It's effective fish. So. How, many, how many colors now? How many colors now? I've been fishing to eight and a half or nine. Jim Lash, how many colors back? Uh, I try not to go further than nine. It's kind of the logistics of it. And, you know, five, you got a big open water and you're trolling straight. But if you start turning, then your jigs kick off the side and you're getting into the timber that you didn't see on your sonar because your jig doesn't follow your boat. You know, it's coming on the inside track. So, and, Honestly, too, what Tom said he didn't like it. Lake Orr's pretty tough on fish, I think. It's um, got that fish hooked up a long time. And we're to the point now, we, I think, we've got to be prudent about that. We need to get them back in the water. And I'm not, I would suggest you don't fish it, but just be mindful of the fact that it stresses them out pretty bad. So I tell people now, if I get one on, look, when we get him up here, if you want him, that's fine. If you don't, somebody better have a camera ready. Because I'm going to pick him up and get one shot and photo your Kodak and do Yes, sir. Yeah. About that too, umbrella rigs, you can get those down pretty deep too, adding some extra weight yep. on your trailers or whatnot. I mean, why one versus the other this time of year? They're both reactionary bait. Uh, That's a bait. great question. He said, the question was, uh, okay, we can get an umbrella pretty deep. There's lots of ways to make an umbrella. Why would we favor lake or over umbrella? And that's a good point because it's easier on the fish because we don't have to fish 300 feet back. As a general rule, if you took one of our lead, if you took uh, our big bucktail umbrella for every ounce of lead you add, if you took the depth chart, we get about two feet of depth. You can add weight in any one of several ways. You can put bigger jigs on it. You can put an egg sinker on the line above the umbrella. The only drawback with that is you get the rig hung and the sinker slides up here and it gets hung and you drop the retriever on it. You can't move the retriever. It's hard unless you bust the sinker out of it. You don't get the retriever to the rig, so take an egg sinker and put a tooth, use a bass fisherman's trick, take a toothpick and take it to your line where it doesn't slide. You're probably better off just to put a couple of two ounce jigs on it, or maybe go all the way around the outside corner with two ounce jigs. So you just added about five ounces of lead, which just gave you an extra 10 feet. Somebody might know Marty Allgood, he used to guide a lot. He started fishing his rigs this time of year with nine two ounce jigs. You just see him on the graph, they fish right under the boat, and he can get it down 50, 60 feet, whatever he wanted. And he can twist and turn on the dime because it's right under it. That's a real viable technique. That's a great, that's a really good point, and we probably need to be doing more of that because it is. This is a reactionary bite, and we've got nine jigs instead of one, which in theory makes that reaction stronger. But, but yeah, just to add the weight, take, take the chart off the thing, put it in the boat. 
but use that two ounce guide. Every two ounce, you no foot. Then that's pretty, that, again, if you don't tweak your speed, that's a good point. And you can get him in, get him out, get him back in the water. So, I don't think, I felt like the fish did well this year. I didn't feel like, uh, I, I, I felt like I didn't have as much problem getting them to swim off this year as I had some years past. So hopefully we had, uh, we got a lot of them back and we can catch them in the end. They'll grow up and be bigger. Any other questions? Comments? All right, Tom, you ready to eat? Tom's already gone. He's already eating somewhere. <laughs> All right. Guys, I appreciate it. I'll be glad to answer any questions you got. Always a treat coming over and talking to you. Maybe I said something that'll get you an extra bite or something. So I hope so. All right.